One of the distinctives of what we do is that we usually teach verse by verse through the Bible. And the cool thing is, you don't have to take my word for it. In fact, you guys would be considered Bereans if you don't take my word for it. Paul told the Bereans, when he preached the gospel to the, to the Bereans, they were like, <laughs> no, we're going to check first. We're going to, we, uh, no. Nah. Oh, all right, you're all right. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, you're all right. But yet, Paul, Paul says the Bereans were more noble. They were considered more noble because they didn't just take, because some dude said this is what happened. They went and checked for themselves. And that is the best way to, to grow as a believer. And we were in Albania. I preached a message at this church there. And I asked them, I said, what would happen if I, just for a day, if I just ate for you guys? Even just a day, like ate, instead of you guys eating, I ate your meal. <laughs> I'd probably weigh 500 pounds and you would be malnourished. You'd be like, man, stomach would be growling and you'd end up getting angry, hangry, uh, hungry and angry at me. Yeah, hangry. Hungry and angry. Bad combination. And the point is that I can dish up stuff, but you have to eat for yourself. You got to get the word of God for you. When you give God a chance to speak through the word, he shouts through the word. He will speak right to your heart. I mean, directly to you. As opposed to, you know, Christian music is cool. Christian music is good. Uh, listening to pastors is good. But there's nothing like, th it's not the same as getting this food. The other stuff is like condiments. It's, it's like some oregano or salt or something on the food. But, it's, but to get, to be nourished properly, spiritually, you got to get into this. And that's, that's why we emphasize the teaching of the word from Genesis to Revelation. And if you guys stick around, we will be able to say, yeah, we've gone through the entire word of God. And we'll be able to stand before God and be like, Lord, I read your text messages. And you think about, I say this a lot, but you think about if somebody texted you 66 text messages, you know, right? <laughs> there are 66 text messages and you see them in the supermarket. You're in the produce aisle and you're sitting there in the produce aisle and all of a sudden, oh man, that, that's that, they're going to ask me, did I read the messages? Right? Me, I know how I am. I would ease my way to like the cereal aisle or something. I'd be like, I would be trying to get out of it. I'd get on the opposite side of the supermarket. And why? Because I didn't read the messages. I didn't read the messages that they sent me. And so God has sent us 66 text messages and we don't want to stand before him. <laughs> and he's going to be like, did, did you actually read my, my, my text, man? <laughs> my wife says this to me all the time because I thought I was doing a good thing by prioritizing her on my, my iPhone. So I put her text up top on my iPhone. So, but what happens is I end up missing like a bunch of her texts. So she's like, did you read my text? You don't even read my text. Why are you prioritizing me? Because you're missing my texts, you know, and it, you don't want to, you don't want to miss God's messages because he's, he speaks loud and clear. And the crazy thing is that they're love, they're love letters to us as a group and individually. If you have your Bibles, we're going to take a break from the book of Acts just for today. We're normally in the book of Acts. We're, we just started it. But if you have your Bible, we're going to Luke 24. I'll read it to you. This is Luke, 20, uh, Luke, Luke chapter 24, and I'm only going to read a section. Um, but on the first day, starting in verse 1, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. When they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. And I just want to stop there for a second. That he has risen. They went on the first day of the week, which is today, which is what, it's what we celebrate today. This is what we actually celebrate this day. This is, this is like, you know, like I said, like the Super Bowl for, for Christians. But why? That's the question. Why? What is this all about? Some, some dude died? 2000. Why do you have to? What, what does that have to do with anything? What is the point? What, yeah, what, what is, you know, why, why is this even a big day? First of all, if you look at the resurrection of Christ, it is out of Every document, the resurrection of Christ and the Gospels, is the, 
is the, from anything from antiquity, it dwarfs, as far as evidence, for the resurrection of Christ. And you could just look at a few things. Was he killed? Of course, a non-Christian historian, Josephus, even writes, yeah, Jesus was killed. He was absolutely, he was definitely killed because he was put on the cross by the Romans. And if the Romans messed up, if they were supposed to crucify somebody and they didn't, they got off the cross, them, them and their whole families potentially would be killed. That's a historical fact because it's happened. When, you're, when these guys are charged to execute somebody and that person gets off, you know, we have precedent for that in the book of Acts. They, they, they talk about it in the book of Acts where, where when Peter got out of, out of prison, those guards got killed. So Jesus was definitely killed. There's you know, no question about it. In fact, the word excruciating comes from crucifixion. Like the root of it's cruci excruciating comes from crucifixion. The Romans perfected the art of killing people. Like they didn't invent crucifixion, but they perfected it. And they made it so that you would be on the cross as long as possible without dying so that you would really pay and suffer. So he definitely died. That's really not, that's not a question. That's not a problem for a lot of people. You know, everybody dies. You know, everybody that's ever lived has died. The problem is the empty tomb. <laughs> what happened on, su on Sunday morning? That's, the, that's where the problem is. And the tomb was definitely empty. If they could have produced his body, they would have shut this whole thing down 2,000 years ago. Shut it down. There would be no Christianity. All they have to do is produce a body. Like, this is the dude you're worshiping, you know? Some people, there was a theory that Jesus seminar came out with a theory that Jesus really didn't die um, on the cross. He just caught a massive beat down. You know, he lost, you know, lost pints of blood and uh, he caught the beat down of, of all time. And, uh, but somehow, somehow he, somehow he survived the, the crucifixion. Somehow he survived, in spite of what I just told you about the Romans being experts, perfecting the art of crucifixion. Somehow Jesus survived it. That strains any type of credibility. So the tomb was empty. That was a problem. The people that put him on the cross tried to say, well, the disciples came and stole the body. Okay, all right. I guess that's an option. It doesn't really square with, with reality. The disciple doesn't square with what these dis disciples shared, and I'll share in a second one of the main reasons why. He made appearances, though. So after Sunday morning, he, he's back to life. The stone is rolled out the way, and then he appears to people. And he didn't just appear to the women. He appeared to the women first, which, yeah, Mary Magdalene, and then to the, to the other women. He, he, you know, he appeared to them. And the fact that he appeared to women it also points to, the, to squash a lot of the arguments that people try to make against Christianity for putting women down or anything, because over and over, Christianity elevates women rather than relegates them. You know, if you were going to write some kind of crazy story, you wouldn't have the women... In that culture, you wouldn't have the women be the ones to, to first see him. He made appearances to Paul. He made, appear, he made appearances to Peter. He made appearances to over 500 people on a hill at the same time. And Paul writes this in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. He says, basically what he's saying is, Jesus appeared, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, he's like appeared to 500 people on the hill, who, some of whom are still alive. Basically saying, go ask them. He was saying that to the Corinthians. Go ask them. Some of them are still alive. He appeared to 500. There, I tell you what, we could all be hallucinating. There's no such thing as a group hallucination, though. <laughs> like we could take something and, you know, some funny gummies or something, and we could be seeing things, but there's no such thing as a group, group hallucination. Yeah, it's not hap that's not happening. It's ridiculous. Yet 500 of these witnesses saw him. Then you look at, what I was going to tell you about before is, is the, the transformation of the disciples. These guys, they went to the gnarliest deaths. They like, uh, every one of them went face, straight up face death. And basically what they were saying was, yo, you can kill me, man. You can kill me. You, I, know what I, I know what I saw. I touched him. I, he ate right in front of me. You can kill, nobody's going to die for a, something they know is a lie nobody is going to die for, I'm telling you right now, there are people that die for lies all the time, but nobody is going to die for something they know is a lie. And at some point, the disciples, one of them dudes would have been like, hey man, we, yo man, we made that up, man. I just came in for the coffee. I, next thing you know, I, you know, just, I, what's happening here? You don't kill me. But every one of them was like, no. 
My, work, my life is worth nothing, dude. You got nothing on me. You can take my life. It doesn't matter because I'm coming back because he came back. I saw him. When you have that, that type of confidence, a, a crucified life in the sense of us being crucified with Christ in our hearts. And these guys, they were crucified with Christ in their mind. They were like, yo, you can kill me. The transformation of the disciples, the guys, you look at Peter, he was basically punked by a, a little servant girl who came up to him and she was like, yo, you're, you're with him, aren't you? You're one, of, you're, one of those, you're one of those Galileans. He was like, I don't, I don't know the man. And he did it three times. He said, I don't know the man three times. He denied him. Jesus told him he was going to deny him. And he, he denied him three times and ran off and wept bitterly after it happened. He wept and cried and he was so hurt and upset, in part because he let the Lord down and just all, a whole mix of emotions going on. But if you look at him 50 days later, he's standing up basically in the same place in front of 3,000 people saying, yo, this Jesus that you guys, cru he was bold. He had a boldness and he had power and strength to speak and confidence. And you can only get that kind of, you're not getting that type of confidence from a lie or something you cooked up. If they got together and like, well, we need to, we need, we need to, we need to make some kind of story up. No, it's not happening. It does, it just, it's ridiculous. It makes no sense. No, there's no reason for Peter to go out there, put his life on the line, or these disciples to put their lives on the line. But you look from then to now, this same Jesus encounters people, changes their lives, invades their hearts, even though we haven't seen him. At least I haven't. I don't know, maybe you guys might have eaten them gummies. I don't know. But I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, no, I haven't seen him or, or heard an audible voice, yet I know him intimately. He speaks to my heart, and I'm looking forward to the day when I do see him face to face. That day's coming. And he, this same Jesus, has transformed lives from the first century. He transformed those guys, those disciples, and he tr has been transforming people's lives, invading their lives, and saving people's souls and changing their eternity for good, since then, to this present day, he has been doing that. And you look at the people that give their lives even today. There have been more people killed for the name of Christ in the last hundred years or the last century than there have been all the other centuries combined up to that point. There have been more people martyred for the name of Christ. And every one of them's like, yeah, you're going to have to kill me, man. You're going to have, you, you, you can kill me. I'm not cool with it, but you can kill me because I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that I will stand with him. We're coming back. See, the first question I asked was why? What is, what, what is this all about? What was the whole point of this? Why, why did Jesus have to come? Because God, before he even said, let there be light, in the mind of God, Jesus was the lamb that was going to take away the sin of the world. God made everything perfect. God doesn't make mistakes, so everything he makes is perfect, right? So he's like the ultimate designer. He is the standard of perfection, holiness, righteousness, and perfection. The problem is, if he's going to give us any kind of choice, which in his perfection, he deemed right to give us an opportunity to choose or to reject him, the same way no parent is, is going to hold a gun to their kid and say, tell me you love me. If the kid says, I love you, is it real? No. That's, that's, that's coercion. That's, 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 that's being, you're being forced to say, I love you. God doesn't want us to come to him because he commands us to come to him. And there must be an option, freedom. There must be some kind of freedom given for love to be legit and true and real. So when a child comes to you and says, Mommy, Daddy, I love you. I really love you. That's real. That wasn't forced. That's real love. So let's apply that to God. When he created everything, he created everything perfect, yet he created the potential to reject him. And in Genesis, I'll read it. You don't have to go there. In Genesis 2, you go back to the very, very beginning. Genesis 2, in verse 15 and 16, he says, God put, they're talking about Adam, Adam, the first man, first dude. God put the man 
in the Garden of Eden to work it and, and keep it. Verse 16, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you, you surely may eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's the Bible that Adam had. That's the word of God that Adam had. That's what God spoke to Adam. I mean, he's no doubt he probably spoke other things, but as far as what we have recorded, the word of God, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for the day you eat of it, you're going to die. Don't do that. And what does Adam do in Genesis 3? His wife goes, Eve goes and eats of the tree. And it was a, it was a rebellion. Adam knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. Eve was deceived, but Adam, Adam knew. He was right there when the whole thing went down. And people like to mock this whole story. Oh, the Genesis story, that's myth, fable, whatever, whatever. No, this is legit. This is real. Why is it real? Because Jesus spoke of it as being real. I'll get to why Jesus validates everything. Today we ce celebrate why he validates everything. But the point being, as far as in Genesis 3, critics, they like to say, oh, you know, and it's never called an apple in Genesis. It's just a fruit, right? But the point is, eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. If you drill down into that, that word, knowledge, is the same exact word that's used for Adam when he slept with Eve. He knew his wife. It's an intimacy. It's about, it's not a sexual thing. It's, a, it's an intimacy of knowing at a level of becoming one with. Now, put that in with knowing good, and now here's the problem, and evil. That's the problem. It's not some fruit. And, you know, they want to make, oh, it's, they ate a fruit, so God's mad. No! It's because you, you don't eat of the, the tree of uh, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm not worried about the good, but the evil is the problem. And we see the repercussions of that choice vibrating throughout every society on the planet. And it has been for millennia. Because you can see humans do incredible good. But we see some of the nastiest evil, unimaginable evil that a human being will do to another human being. And it goes back to that. It all goes back to that because we are intimate with the knowledge of good and the knowledge of evil. We have become one with evil and one with good. So there's a problem as soon as Adam and Eve sinned and messed up. They took the choice and said, ah, you know, ah, I'm, I want to do it my way. Because if you look at what Satan said to the woman, the first thing Satan says, the first thing a certain serpent says, the first thing he says is, did God actually say? You shall not eat of any tree. In wait, 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 what? Wait a minute. If I go back and look at what God said, God said you are free to eat of every tree. What does Satan say? Did God say you can't eat? God never said you can't eat. God said you are free to eat. He said just do not eat of the, the tree. But you, Adam and Eve were still free to eat of that tree. God could have barred them from doing that. But he Kept his, he, they were truly free. And here Satan comes in and twists the word of God, twist, throws in a word and twists it. He's been doing the same thing since. Did God actually say? Questioning the word of God. Is this actually the word of God? No, nah, that's, that's a myth, man. That's, that's, some old, that's some old stuff. It's all corrupted. It's, it's been passed down. And uh, you, can't, you can't trust that. Did God really say? It's the same thing. It's the same line. And the woman said to the serpent, we can eat from the trees of the, in the garden. God said, you shall eat, not eat of the tree of the, in the midst of the garden, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. She's adding words to what he said. He didn't say that. Then the serpent says, this is the key right here. This is where he, this is where he shifts it in, into high gear to what we see today. The serpent said to Eve, you will not surely die. Straight up contradicting. So first questioning the word of God. Let's question it. Is it really the word of God? Did God say? And then straight up contradicting it. You're not going to die. You won't die. God said in the day you eat of it, you're going to die. You won't die. God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So now he's playing on pride. You'll be like him. You'll, you can be a God. You can be like God. Pride. That's the root of every problem. It, it comes down to pride whether or not we're going to obey God or not. But 
I'm going to fast forward. They dropped the ball. They ate of the fruit. They did what they weren't supposed to do. Adam and Eve then realized, oh boy, we messed up here. We made a mistake. And they went and grabbed fig, fig leaves. You guys, I, you have fig trees down here in North Carolina? Yeah. yeah. It's up in New Jersey they have fig trees. I know that. But I, I guess they have everything here. If they have alligators. They got everything. Yes. Yeah. So they went and they grabbed fig leaves and they sewed fig leaves together and tried to cover their nakedness. This is another thing that people like to try to mock Christianity. Oh, but what's the big deal about being naked? It's not about walking around without... It's a need for covering. That's the thing. Now Adam and Eve need, to, need a covering because they have sinned and they recognized it. And what did they do? They tried to cover up their problem. They tried to cover themselves up and man can never ever... Man cannot cover up his, his sin. No matter what man does, we started out with a white robe and it's like we spilled grape juice all over it. No matter what you do, you can't get the stain out. It's, it's, it's never going to be 100% perfect. And Adam and Eve, they were trying to, that's a picture of religion. Religion says, okay, if I do this, if I do this, I can get right with God. If I do, 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 do. Christianity says, no, God has done what needs to be done. And I'll give you the example. I'll show you how. Adam and Eve, they tried to make fig leaves. Fig leaves cannot cover. They don't work. They're going to fall apart. It's not going to work. But in verse 20 of Genesis 3, it says, or 21, the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. This must have completely blown Adam's mind because up to that point, nothing died. I mean, there wasn't killing like we, we've got a different point of reference. We grow up, we see blood all the time. Here, God takes an innocent animal brings an innocent animal to Adam and Eve. Actually, let's, let me rewind the tape a little bit. Right when they sinned, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the human condition and this problem and became sinners, like everyone else, like all of us, as soon as it happened, it says God was walking in the cool of the day and God said, Adam, where are you? Anytime God asks you a question, he already knows the answer. He's, a, he's the best lawyer there is. No lawyer is going to ask you a question. He doesn't already know the answer in court, right? Well, God asks Adam, not for God's knowledge. God doesn't need to know where he is. Adam, where are you? That's a heavy question. Where are you? And what was Adam doing? He was hiding from God. That's the first reaction we have when we sin and really know it's, it's not natural for us to run to God when we, when we make mistakes. It's, it's not natural. It's... it's, it's Oh man, I, I, I got to hide. I got to try to cover this up. But yet God came seeking Adam. And then after God says in Genesis uh, 15, 3.15, Genesis chapter 3.15, he makes the first, the first promise of a gospel. He said the, the seed of a woman is going to come and the, the serpent's going to bruise his heel, but he's going to basically crush the head of the serpent. And from that seed right there in Genesis 3.15, it's what we call the the first gospel promise. It's the proto-evangelum in the Greek. It is the very first promise of a gospel and the entire Bible from that seed starts opening up. This seed of the woman, who, what? Seed of the woman? The dude is the one with the seed, traditionally. And so that right there says, points to the virgin birth of Christ. It's gonna be something special. The seed of the woman. The woman's gonna have a son? Wait, wait what's, what? So the seed of the woman is going to come and the entire Bible starts opening up from this point on. As soon as sin showed up, God showed up with the plan. And he gives this plan, the seed of the woman, and then after he gives that, he takes an innocent animal and brings it right before Adam and Eve. And he kills it. Sheds the, the first bloodshed is, is by the hands of God. He pulls the skins off and makes coverings for them. That's a picture of the gospel right there. Adam and Eve could not even cover their, they couldn't cover themselves, but God could. God is the one who provided the covering for them. He provided the animals, showed them how to do it. Now you fast forward through the book, the book starts opening up about redemption and this, this plan, this scarlet thread moves throughout the entire scripture about this one that's coming and God providing a way through because he doesn't want us to suffer his judgment. The judgment was, was designed for the, the angels that rebelled against him. They have no out. They're locked into their positions. But us, the pinnacle of, our, of creation, 
He wants us to have fellowship, and he even made a way where there was no way. And that's, that's actually another thing. Let me back up. People try to, I personally, I, it doesn't say when Satan fell or nothing like that, but if you think about it, God's sitting there, he's making everything, right? And he makes all this stuff, and then, you know, he makes you, you're an angel, and he makes you an angel, and you're like, man, this is all right, I'm, uh, you know, we're something special. Maybe you're even in charge of the worship. And then all of a sudden you see God spending, like bending down with making mud. What is he doing? And he makes this mud and he breathes into the mud. The mud starts moving and the mud, he starts spending time with the, with, the, with the mud. That's Adam. He makes Adam. If you're an angel, you're a higher functioning being. You're like, I mean, that's how, I believe that's how, they, they, that's how pride was found in them. They were jealous. They were upset. Some of them. And they had a ringleader. Their ringleader was probably the one that was their, the worship leader before Adam showed up on the scene. And there's pride like, well, yeah, you know, I don't mind being right here with God, leading worship for God and everything like that. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 I'm not number one, number two anymore. I'm not, what? What is this? And a, Satan has had it out for mankind ever since, ever since. You fast forward, you have the story of Noah and the great salvation through that flood, the, 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 the global flood. God provided salvation there. You have the story of uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Abraham when he took his son Isaac up the mountain, up the hill to sacrifice. God, it's the only place in the Bible where God asked for a human sacrifice except for the true sacrifice, which is Christ. And then us, when we are supposed to be living sacrifices. Book of Romans, it says we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifice, not dead sacrifices. But he, he called Abraham. He said, I want you to sacrifice your son, your one and only son. And Abraham was like, what, what? And okay. And he just reckoned in his mind that, well, God can raise the dead. So I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do what he said. And Abraham and Isaac were walking. Isaac carried the wood. Isaac is a type of Christ in there. Abraham is a type of the father. Isaac carried the wood. He said, father, we have, uh, we have the wood for the sacrifice. Well, where's the lamb? And Abraham said, God himself will provide. God will provide. And as he was, he took out the knife and he was about to kill his son, his one and only son that God promised him. After, you know, he was 100 years old when the kid was born, man. This was a miracle son. And God says, you know, I want you to kill him. And he's about to, and God shouted from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't kill the boy. Now I know that you love me. Now I know. Now I know. And God knew. And then he opened Abraham's eyes and Abraham could see this ram that was caught in the bushes. And he was so happy. And he sacrificed that ram. And he, he said, Jehovah Jireh, God provided. And where that happened is where the same place, 2,000 some years later, Christ would be crucified on the cross. The same place it went down, right there, where Jehovah Jireh, where God provided on that mountain of Moriah is where Christ stretched out because he, being the Lamb of God, took the blame, the penalty for every single person from Adam to the present day, no person has been able to meet the requirements of God. He's perfect. Everybody around him's got to be perfect. He, that doesn't make him mean. If I wanted to, well, I actually did go to an Ivy League school, but I mean, say I wanted to go to uh, Stanford, uh, Harvard, um, UPenn, and I had, uh, the only way I got in was I had straight A's. That's it. And I barely got in that way. But you're not getting, it doesn't make him mean. They just have standards. They're standards. That's all. It's a standard. And God has the highest standards of all. Perfection. It doesn't make him mean. He's just perfect and everybody around him has to be perfect. The problem is nobody's perfect. From Adam to the present day, nobody's been perfect. One way or another, every single person has been disqualified. Some are worse than others, but it doesn't matter. Every single person is in a disqualified room. The only person that was not disqualified was Christ. And he said, you know what? I'll be I'll be banned, and I'm going to let you take my righteousness. I'm going to let you take, you, you can ha I'm going to give my life for you. And he's the only one who could. He was the perfect, sinless, spotless lamb of God. And he took away the sin of the world. He who knew no sin became sin for us. But it doesn't end there. That's not where it ends. Because on Sunday, that was the Friday, where the lamb of God was slain and the blood was shed, the blood that covers us. You guys know this, you know, the story of Moses with, with the Passover, that whole thing. I'm not going to go into it, but they had to take an innocent lamb and kill it and take the blood and put the blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over. That blood spoke and 
Christ is our lamb. His blood on the doorpost of our heart by faith, nothing that we did, but just by put, putting our faith in him and trusting him, saying, Lord, I believe. I just, uh, Lord, uh, yeah, I, I, forgive me of my sins. I want to I be in the family of God. I want to know. If you're real, please, you know, show me. Live through me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. By doing that, you get the blood of Christ on the doorpost of your heart. You are not subject to wrath. The wrath of God, which was not kindled for mankind in the first place. It was kindled for the, for the uh, opposite team, his whole crew. You know, I'll give you another example. I noticed there were a lot of fires going on down by the Handy Hugo's over here, right? They take all that stuff and they, they, I guess it's easier to just get rid of and burn it down. It reminded me of something. A lot of firefighters, when they're fighting uh, like forest fires, they do controlled burns. Right? And they'll burn an area down and, and let it burn out. So that if a, if a raging forest fire comes and it's consuming all the fuel and the forest fire comes, it gets to the area that was burnt out. There's, nothing to, there's, there's no fuel. It, there's nothing for it to do. And a lot of times the firefighters will burn out an area, let it burn out, and they call that good black because it's, it's an area where they can run to. If things go sideways, they can go to that area and the flames will go around them and not burn them up because they're standing in the area that is already burnt up. When we trust Christ, we stand in the area that has already been burnt up and suffered the wrath of God. So when we stand in Christ by faith, the wrath of God, it passes over us because we're in an area that has already taken, the, the, the fuel's been burnt. It's take, he's taken the blame and the penalty. We don't have to pay the penalty. Does that make sense? The Sunday today, and I'm coming in for a landing here, guys. You know I can start preaching on this. The Sunday, the Sunday is a stamp, a sign, a seal of approval that the sacrifice that Christ made is accepted in the eyes of God. It is acceptable. And because God raised him from the dead, and these guys all went to the gnarliest death saying, yo, I saw him, I ate with him. He's alive. I don't care what you do to me. He's alive, man. You want to kill me? Go ahead. I ate with him. I, I saw him pulled up in the heaven. You've got nothing. You could take my life because he said he's coming back and I'm coming back with him. Every other re religious leader is, is dead. You can find their tombs. He's the only one that... To this day, people continue to run into the risen Christ. I'll give you a quick story. There's a, there's a lady. I don't, it's a, I don't know if it's a Christian. It's been morphed a bunch of times, this story. But it was set in World War II. This lady, she was put in a Japanese prison camp for many years, a bunch of years. And then afterwards, after the war was over, some evangelists were coming through the area. It might have been the Philippines or something like that. And... Uh, and this guy's preaching about Jesus. And this lady comes up after, and she's got tears coming out of her eyes. And she says, thank you so much. Now I finally know his name. And the guy was like, what are you talking about? He's the one who was with me when I was in that prison camp for seven or eight years. He was with me in the, in the depths and the, the most difficult part of my life. He was the one that was with me and spoke to my heart. And she had tears coming out of her eyes. And she said, now I know his name. I know him. This Jesus is the same. He's the same guy. He's the one that changes lives. He's the one that um, has, has come into our lives. And the one that ministers to us in the most messed up, difficult situations. And a lot of people will be like, well, he's God. Why does he let this happen? There are two things that you can hang on to when God, I, I, I can't speak for God. It's just difficult why he lets certain things happen. We'll know when we get to glory why. And I know one thing. We're going to go, wow, okay. I can't fault you at all there. But I will say this. There are two things you can hold on to. The character and nature of God, the person who he is. This one that when sin showed up, he showed up on the scene. He pursued Adam and Eve. He didn't say, I'm done with you. I'm starting over finished. He showed up right on the scene. The character and nature of this God that we, that we praise and worship is good. He's perfect. He does not make mistakes, right? He is the definition of love. He's the standard of love, right? He's absolutely perfect, 
does not make mistakes. So if he's absolutely perfect, absolutely loving, and does not make mistakes, okay, that's something I can hold on to. That's number one. Number two is the cross of Christ. If he himself had to suffer this first go around and was not exempt from suffering, then I can at least hold on to the fact that he's good. His word says he loves me. I do not get this. I don't understand it. Christ suffered as well. And when we get to glory, we're going to go, okay, bravo. Okay, bravo on everything he allowed. And it's difficult because we've been through really, all of us, I mean, every one of us, right, can, can relate to some scratch your head moments like, where's God right here? Where, where are you, Lord? Where are you? And what Jesus said from when he was on the cross, what he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sambatani. That means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ himself on the cross, suffering for us. That happened on a Friday. The people, they, they, they wagged their heads, they, they mocked him, they spit at him, they laughed at him. And he suffered, unbelievable. He suffered in a way that we'll never completely understand. We'll never, we'll never completely grip what happened in those three hours between noon and three when the wrath of God was poured out on him for all humanity. When he who knew no sin became sin, he was completely sinless and perfect. We, we, I don't, we're never gonna, we're never gonna get that. But he himself suffered so that we would not have to suffer an eternity without him. And what God did in the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, he made the skins for, but he also pushed them, told them they gotta get out. And he put a, a barrier to the other tree, the tree of life. Because had they taken of the tree of life in a sinful state, they, that would be hell. Because they would live for all eternity in a sinful, messed up state, being intimate with evil. So what did God do? He, he prevented them from eating from that tree until the gospel, until Christ was able to come and redeem. So now man has an opportunity. And God being the gentleman that he is, still gives, doesn't force anyone. He's not dragging anyone into his presence. He's giving people an option because that's who he is. That is who you are, we sang, right? That's who he is. And this day, we celebrate the fact that Jesus came out of the grave and like the other disciples, we have a hope that is different than everything else in the world because the fact that he came out the grave is not just you know, like a token at the amusement park or something like that. The fact that he came out the grave means that everything he says is validated. Like everything he quotes is validated. Everything he says is validated. And you know what he said? He said, besides the fact that he said, I love you. And, uh, you know, my father knows how many hairs are on your head. I don't even know how many hairs. I know I have a lot less than I did last week. <laughs> but the fact that God knows intimately more about you and loves you more than the thing that you absolutely love the most in the whole world. He loves you infinitely more than that. We can bank on that. And we can also, he also said, guess what? I'm coming back. And in our Acts studies, in the books of uh, Acts, or our sermons, we're talking about that. You know, we're gonna get into what's gonna happen. What did he actually say? Everything that he said was going to happen, has happened, except for the things that are supposed to come. And they're coming. They're, they're, it's like a freight train coming, coming soon. Amen? Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for what today represents. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. Lord, I thank you for uh, the opportunity to even get into your word and, and to uh, even to know who you are, Lord. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made so long ago so that we could have fellowship with you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We praise you. We love you. Uh, Lord, help us. Fill us with your spirit. Help us to walk in the joy of the Lord and in the power of God, that you might be pleased in the life that we live. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.